everyone. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Uh, today I get to talk with you all about two of my favorite topics, uh, simplicity and security. Um, just as a, like, a cautionary, there is code on some of my slides. Um, one of the reasons is because Clojure code is absolutely beautiful. Um, and the other reason is because I wanted to kind of show a concrete implementation of how you implement these concepts that I'm going to talk about in Ring. Um, but if you're hungry and you don't want to read code, then just ignore it. Um, just kind of co focus on the concepts. That's, that's the main point I want to get across. When we talk about closure applications, often we talk about simplicity. And what I love about closure the most is that the whole language was designed with this concept of simplicity. Um, that means that, the, that it is composed of small little pieces, which I can put together. Um, and then they make something that is still simple, that I still can understand. I can follow in each step in the program exactly what happens. Um, and I think a great example of this is Ring, um, which is, is the example I'm going to use during this talk. Um, Ring is an HTTP server abstraction, uh, which, say, uh, which looks at HTTP and says, HTTP is a stateless protocol. Um, it takes a request and returns some kind of response. Um, that looks kind of like a function. So let's model it as a function. So that's what Ring does. Ring is, um, a, as I said, is a server abstraction. So we can define requests as data, as a map. And we can, refine, we can define responses as data, as a map. And we just create a function that follows the contract, that has the fields that we need um, for our application. And then as long as we follow this contract, we can plug it into the adapter level the layer, which, which performs, like, it does a translation between the, the um, contract and the server instance, which is underneath it, and it will work. Um, and and we, when we do this, we notice that there are a lot of patterns that repeat themselves. Uh, maybe every time we get a response, we want to set a security header. Maybe every time we get a request, we want to add session information. And for this uh, reason, for this pattern, we can use middleware. And middleware is just a function that takes another function, this handler that we've already defined, and executes uh, and returns a new, f new handler a new that will take a request and execute the request in, in the handler that we gave our middleware. But the, the trick by it is that um, we can modify a request before sending it to our web application, or we can modify the response on the way out. And sometimes, one of the main use cases for this is if we say, um, if I get a request from, well, that's a get request at, at the uh, slash resource, then I want to go to this handler. If it's at another resource, I want to go to another handler. And because that is so necessary in a web application, there are libraries building on top of this, this kind of middleware that provide us with routing. Um, through the application, where I just get, what, get some request, and I can route it to the, the handler that I want it to be handled by, and then route the response back. And then once I have all these pieces, they all follow exactly the same contract. And so I can just put them all together. Um, and I, can, and I, I really love this example because it really is simple. If we look at this picture, we can see every step in my program, where is my response going? Uh, what, is, what is happening with it? Each of these components has exactly one job. Um, and, and if I need a component that does five jobs, I just compose the other five together into one component using functional composition, and it retains the simplicity. Um, there's one question. Where's the security? Security, as we know, is not the same as magical framework. Um, there are a lot of magical frameworks in, in the world, you know, they do something crazy. Maybe they're helping us secure our application, maybe not. Um, and in framework enclosure, I have the feeling it's kind of like a bad word. So we know we don't want a magical framework. We already know that. Um, but if we look at this, this example, we've put this application together. And the point I want to make here is that no, security is not the same as 
of magic framework, but it is also not the same as no framework at all. And because we have this power um, to create the web applications ex in exactly the, web the, the specification that we want them to have, um, we also have the responsibility to add that last piece to our application. We need to understand what we're talking about, and we need to have this security aspect to our application. Because we have, we have to put the application a little bit together, we have the responsibility to take care of the security aspect. Security is teamwork and review. Um, we have to work together. Uh, it helps if we, have, we work in a team, we do reviews, we see, uh, have two, more than one pair of eyes looking at a, at a piece of source code. And there's some principles about how to, maintain, to keep a, a secure web application. First of all, we need to maintain our application. We need to make sure we have the most up-to-date dependencies, make sure that, there's, uh, that we don't have any bugs in our application. If we get a bug, a bug report, we need to fix it. We need to stay informed about the different vulnerabilities that exist, um, and we can register for security advisories. We can keep it simple, uh, which is one of the things that I think is very, uh, in, in Clojure, we do want to keep it simple. That's one of the, the points. And so the nice thing about it is, is if we program web applications, it really is simple. And we really can see in our, in our uh, source code wh what happens in which point in our application. But then we also need to, um, to look, and at it, particularly from the security aspect, to make sure that everything is there that needs to be there. That comes back to the point that we need to know what we're doing. Um, we can't just ship some secure framework and say, oh, I have no idea about security, but um, someone told me that this framework is secure, so that's OK. We are responsible for our web application, so we need to understand the main uh, security vulnerabilities that are, that are there and what we can do to uh, fix them. And we also need to monitor our application in real time and see what's actually happening with our application so that we can, if there is any vulnerabilities, then we can uh, maybe um, recognize them faster. Uh, when it comes back to knowing what we can do, um, I always use the OWASP top 10 list. Um, the 2017 version just came out, which really was exciting for me. Um, and when it comes to security, there's a lot of vulnerabilities that we aren't necessarily, we might, if we're running on a, um, AWS and AWS has a security vulnerability, then there's not that much I can do about it. But as a developer, all of these things on this top 10 list um, are things that I can hand, that manage. If I can look at my application and think, am I vul vulnerable for injection attacks? Am I vulnerable for cross-site scripting attacks? Just even if we think our application is um, great, everything's okay, we can just go back over the list and, and do a review of our code with these aspects in mind. So I just have a friendly reminder for you to use SSL. Um, if we aren't using SSL, we're sending any cookies, authentication information in clear text through the internet, um, and you're basically just opening a door wide for uh, people to come and uh, hack into your application. Uh, you can enable it in your Clojure application itself, or you can run your application behind, behind a reverse proxy. Um, the main point is that use SSL. That's what it's there for. With uh, Let's Encrypt, it's easier than ever to get a certificate, um, so we can just turn it on. The next vulnerability I want to talk with you about is cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting is a vulnerability that pops up in the wild all the time. Um, this is an example. It's from uh, McDonald's in uh, January 6th of this year. They discovered an XSS vulnerability in the McDonald's site, which basically allowed you to um, read all the passwords of, of users. So what is cross-site scripting? Cross-site scripting is when we take user input and we render it in our HTML page. Um, and if our user was nice and never did anything evil, there wouldn't be a problem. The problem is, is that users are inherently not nice, or we shouldn't believe that they're nice. 
Um, we should believe that they are going to try their best to break into, to do whatever they want to do in our application. So basically, if you take some user input from the user and then render it into your page, you have a, a JavaScript tag in your page that executes JavaScript. And that allows the attacker to do whatever they want. This is, a, this is a problem if we want to be nice. And when someone logs in and their username, um, they give it their username, and we want to say, hi, please log in again. And so we, we render their username in the page. Um, but that makes us vulnerable for cross-site scripting. Or it's also often a problem in web forums where you make a comment. And if you're vulnerable for, for cross-site scripting, that comment will be rendered on the forum page whenever you open the website. And then they can, um, so whoever visits the website, then this script will be running um, in, the, in the background. So uh, as far as cross-site scripting, what can we do against it? First of all, we can validate input. That's kind of the rule of thumb, is validate input and escape output. So we can validate input using closure spec or a uh, bouncer. Um, and basically, this is just the rule that if I know what I want the user to give me, I can just make sure that that's what he actually gives me. But sometimes, like when we're, when we're dealing with usernames, uh, we don't want to create a really hardcore spec and say, you're only allowed to use ASCII characters. I mean, we could do that, but everyone nowadays is using UTF-8. Um, they can't spell their name, maybe. So, and then we have to think really hard about what characters we want to allow them to use in their username. Um, so what we can do in that case is that we say, oh, OK, it's so just some string that the, that'll give me for his username. Um, but when I render it in my page, I translate all of the evil characters into the HTML equivalent. So I say, instead of like the less than and greater than signs, I'm going to use the uh, ampersand LT semicolon. Um, and then it will render in the, the browser. It will look like HTML, but it will not be a script that is executable. Um, that's what we want to do, but we shouldn't do this ourselves. Um, we should use a library that, that does escaping for us, because there's a lot of like, edge cases that we don't think about in the first, uh, the, at the first time. Um, there's a lot of, like, like, it's not just less than and greater than signs. There's other things you need to consider. So one of the points I want to make is that we should use an HTML templating library which has escaping by default. Um, this is the case for Unlive. This is the case for Selmer. Hoplon is a JavaScript uh, library that I, I just, just I was just Googling in GitHub to see what templating libraries are actually used in in um, in Closure, the Closure universe. Um, if there's any one that's missing from this list, please uh, message me and I'll look it up because it interests me. Uh, one of the points I want to make on this slide is that Hiccup only supports escaping by default from 2.00 alpha 1, which was released this year in January. Um, so if you're using Hiccup, use the alpha version, um, even though it's alpha. Uh, the problem is, is if, you're, you, if, you, if it's not escaping by default, Hiccup does have an escape HTML function. But if I make my app and I say, OK, I've made sure that every place in my application where I'm rendering user input uses the escape HTML function, I won't be vulnerable for cross-site scripting. But what happens when, in three months, um, I decide I need to add a new view? Will I remember? And that's kind of the thing, is if you use an HTML templating uh, library that has escaping by default, it's not up to you anymore to remember to have to use the escaping function every time you uh, create a web application. The next vulnerability I want to talk about is cross-site request forgery. Um, CSERF for short. Uh, basically, cross-site cross request forgery uh, is when I, because I am an evil person, somehow get a user to go to a website and perform an action on the website without them being aware that that's what they're doing and without them wanting to do it. Um, the typical example of this is if I have a web application um, and I have a form, and then I send a post request to my server with my cookies, and the server says, OK, that sounds good. Uh, the, the trick here is, is that um, we trick the browser. The browser will always send cookies with, with a post request to a website. Um, so an evil application can do exactly the same thing. They can forge this request, um, get me to go to their site, click on the button, and then this post request will be sent to the web server, and it looks exactly the same. And the web server says, OK, 
I'll do it. And we didn't want that to happen. That's what cross-site request, request forgery is. So what can we do to protect against CSERF? One is, the number one rule is don't use get requests to change state. According to the HTTP specification, you shouldn't do this anyway. Get requests should only be for reading state. It should not be for changing state. Uh, so don't do it. Th you can think about it, maybe, and then don't do it. Um, the reason is, is that, that it's really easy to forge a get request. You basically just have to put an image tag on your page, and then every time they go to that page, that the source, which is some like URL, it will send a get request to the server every time. It's really easy to forge, and it's really difficult to protect against. So number one rule, don't use get requests to change state. Please. Um, another thing that we can do is the, it's a new, newer feature, is the same site script, uh, strict cookie attribute, uh, which I can, when I set my cookies in my application, uh, I can set them to be strict, which means that this cookie will only be sent to my web application when uh, when the request actually comes from my web application. It doesn't protect me if I have an XSS vulnerability in my site and the user can come to my site and forge requests as much as they want, um, then you pretty much lost th that game. But uh, it, it will protect you, it will provide some CSER protection. It's only currently supported in Chrome and Opera. It's not supported in Safari, it's not supported in Firefox. Uh, the idea is that maybe in 10 years, we won't have to worry about CSERV attacks anymore. Um, maybe, and that'll be nice when that happens. But what can we do in the meantime? Uh, for this, there's the Ring Anti-Forgery Library, and th this is bas the basic idea of what we can do to protect against CSERV attacks, is that when the user comes to my site, I know this user wants to retrieve this web page. So when I generate a form in my page, um, I add a secret to the form, which is unique to my user and unique to my user session. And then when my user clicks on the form, I send the secret with my user. The server says, oh, OK. And then it performs the action. But in the case that someone's trying to forge this request, they can't do it because they don't know the secret. And so that is to add an extra element to my, uh, my request is, uh, and add a secret, and then this request is only valid if you have your cookies, if you have your secret, and if the request is correct. Um, and other th otherwise, it will return a 403 forbidden, and then it will protect you against these sort of attacks. So Ring, uh, like if you're using a Ring application, Ring Anti-Forgery does exactly this. Um, it is a middleware component in your, uh, w which you can add to your application, and it binds, when, when the middleware comes in, it binds an, an anti-forgery token, a secret, to your session. Um, and then you can render it in the fo a form in your web application. And then the middleware will check when you submit a form if the secret is there, if the secret is the secret it wants. And otherwise, it will not allow the request to be executed. Um, if you are behind a load balancer, and you, you can also use a cookie, session, a cookie store for your session, and then it will work with, uh, behind a load balancer as well. The next vulnerability I want to talk about is actually the number one on the OWASP uh, 2017. Still, it was on the 2013 as well. That's injection attacks. Basically, the principle is the same as with cross-site scripting. Um, just the people we're attacking as the database and not the browser. Um, the principle is the same that I get some user input from the user, and then I use string concatenation to render a query with this input from the user. And then the user, if they can manipulate your queries, they can do a lot of evil things with your database. Uh, the XKCD comic about this uh, is Little Bobby Tables. Um, and it's, it's semi-well-known, pretty well-known, I think. But uh, injection attacks still persist. It's not only SQL. It's also any language where you're querying anything, basically. If you get user input, always escape it. There's libraries to do that. In SQL, with SQL, there's a lot of libraries in Clojure. For instance, one library is YesQL, um, and that just 
does exactly what we think it is. If it gets user input, it escapes all of the evil characters out of it, so the user can't do anything evil in our database. The next point I want to cover is authentication and authorization. How can I uh, plug this into my application? Authentication is the question, how do I know if the user is who he says he is? And authorization is, how do I know if the user is allowed to access a resource? Um, so one way to implement authentication in Clojure is to use Buddy. It's a library. It has four different libraries, actually. There's the core library. And then Buddy Auth, Buddy Hashers, and Buddy Sign are built on top of core. Um, if you are saving your own passwords, if you're saving user information and passwords, remember, you can use Buddy Hashers to hash your passwords um, so you don't, don't save passwords in clear text in your database, rule number one. Um, hash your password beforehand, and then when the user inputs their password, you take the hash of that password and then compare the, the hash in the database. Um, and also save, uh, like use a salt, which means that you add in some like secret that the, the user doesn't know to your password before you hash it, uh, and that makes it um, more secure against rainbow tables, where like rainbow tables is when you, you generate all of the password possible p combinations for passwords like up to 10 characters or something with this hashing function. And then you basically, you can generate a huge database and just look, when you have a hash of a password, you can just look it up in the database. So if you are, do, if you are saving passwords, always remember to hash your password. Um, uh, so, sorry, salt your password first and then hash it. Um, and then you can use, like, you can create an authentication function. So buddy auth uh, is a ring middleware integration. It is unopinionated in that when I am implementing authentication for my application, I just have to implement a function that takes a username and password, verifies my username and password, and returns some authentication token that I say that will be saved in the identity um, uh, in my request map in the identity key, under the identity key. Um, so then. At any point in my application, I can just look at my application. And if the uh, identity key is there, it means that they're authenticated. And if I need to do authorization or something, I can look into and see what, what authentication token is there, what claims are there, and then do uh, authorization. I can also do authorization based on, on that. Um, there's different back backends which are delivered with Buddy Auth. Uh, there's HTTP basic, session token, and signed JOT, and encrypted JOT. And it's also possible to implement, it's pretty easy to implement custom authentication backends uh, of your own if you, if you want some other kind of authentication in your application. This is just a simple authentication example about like, how you would create a function. Like when, I, when I'm talking about we need to create an authentication function, it just, is, it just define a function that takes your request and your authentication information, extracts the username and password from the authentication information, does authentication, and then it returns something that's logically true. And if, you, if it returns logically true, that means you're authenticated. And that token that you return then becomes your, uh, your authentication token in your application. Um, and then you can just create the middleware that performs this application using the backend, like buddy auth backend slash basic, for instance, it's one of the backends, uh, where we plug in the realm and, and the authentication function that we want to use. On that, at that point, if we wanted to create our own backends, we would, like if we wanted to create a custom backend, we would define it, we could define it on that point as well. Uh, so how does authorization work with buddy? Uh, basically, you can define a map listing the access rules for your application um, an access rule looks like you can have a list, like just one URI or maybe multiple URIs. Uh, then the handler, which checks to see based on this um, URI and the authentication information that I have, um, is the user allowed to access this resource or not? Um, and you can also add a request method. So it's a so the 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 rules are executed one after another. If one of the rules is successful, then you're authenticated, or uh, sorry, you're authorized. If not, then it goes on to the next one. So you can have multiple URIs. For instance, like if you want, in this case, the request method get, where if you access user's username with the request method get, you have to, the handler says, if you, as long as you're authenticated, you can do that. Um, 
But if you access the same URI with a post, like any other request method, basically, because I don't specify a request method, then you have to actually be the user in question. Um, and then I can define my own handler, uh, like in this case, it is user, um, where I check, I extract the identity of my user from the request, and then I look in the request, match the name of the user, and, and make sure it's the same person. Um, then in the same way, as like I was talking about middleware earlier, uh, we can just plug these middlewares that we generate based on our rules, based on our authentication function. We can plug them into our um, handler, uh, and then we can then it works. We just plug the middleware in, and then that will perform the authentic authentication and authorization for us. Uh, we can also define a custom like on error for authorization, like the default is to throw an exception, which will be mapped to a 403 um, uh, response. But we can also define an extra function if we want to, to do something else. For instance, in this case, it is re redirecting the user to a login page if they're unauthorized. This is a point I want to leave up there for like two seconds, just to let it sink in. Um, if you're using an API, use authentication for your API, like protect your APIs. The, um, because of the rise of single page applications, um, the, this has become more and more of a problem. The, the one change to the top 10 this year, or the OWASP top 10, uh, that wasn't there in 2013, is that now this is on the OWASP top 10, that more and more there are unprotected APIs available on the internet. It is not sufficient to do authorization and authentication in the front end. You have to do like some kind of authentic authentication or authorization in the back end, um, because it's you can't. I mean, you can't ensure that the only way someone's going to access your API is through your front end. That's the point. Is that if you have some API in the internet, anybody who has Postman, Curl, whatever, can access your API. So protect your APIs. Um, and then just to kind of wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about the security headers which are available. This map is, the, the, is a map of middleware settings. Um, you can get a subset of these. Um, this is for ring, the ring defaults. You can get a subset of these uh, in API def defaults, site defaults, secure site defaults. Um, but I wanted to go through and kind of talk about what they are. Uh, this is worth looking up. Um, it, and just seeing what does this actually mean. For instance, like the cookie attributes, HTTP only, means that if I set this for my cookie, the Java, JavaScript is not allowed to access my cookies. Um, secure means that my cookies will only be sent over HTTPS. Um, Saint site strict is what I talked about earlier. Uh, this is not set by in either of the site, site defaults or secure site defaults. It's not set in either of them. Um, so if you want to, to um, Enable that the same size strict cookie because you're using Chrome. Um, you can do that. Um, and then anti forgery turns on your CSER protection for your application. XSS protection um, turns on, like, a, if a browser performs some kind of XSS protection, uh, you can enable it and then you can put it to mode block, which means that it will block the application. Um, there's frame options that you ensure that they can't do click jacking, that if they embed your application in another iframe or something, that it has to be from the same website. Um, uh, content type options uh, means that they can't sniff and try to figure out what content you're, you're sending. Um, SSL redirect means that if someone accesses HTTP joyclock.org, it will be redirected to HTTPS, joyclark.org, um, so that they can't go to the, the unsecured version. Um, they will always be re redirected to the secure version. And if you want that to be the default, you want once the browser goes to this website, you can set the HSTS header, which will tell your browser, from now on, don't ever try to send this user to the HT like HTTP. Um, setting always send them to the HTTPS, so the browser will, will only send users to the HTTPS 
um, the, sorry, the HTTPS resource after that point. Um, so in summary, use HTTPS. Um, validate user input and escape user output. Um, templating libraries, please use them with automatic HTML escaping, unless you're a superhero, and then use them with automatic HTML escaping anyway. Um, you can look at the site defaults, uh, the ring defaults for ring applications, to see what, what's, what default middleware can, is just kind of, they compose middleware for you that you can just plug into your application. Um, and it's good to understand roughly what those different headers mean, what they're doing. It's not that complicated to understand. You can, you can read up on them on OWASP. It's very uh, informative, and it's good to know why you're setting HSTS for your web application. Uh, and then if you, if you want to use authentication or authorization, you can look into using Buddy for your application. Um, as an example, I wrote a little um, Twitter clone for ducks because they like ducking. They, they like quacking, you know? So um, if you're in, I, I wrote a little application that, that uses the secure site defaults and, and buddy auth authorization and authentication, kind of as it's just a work in progress um, Twitter clone for ducks. So uh, you can look at that if you're interested. If, you're, if you have any comments or concerns or um, whatever, um, you can just write me at my email, joy.clark at noq.com, or on Twitter, um, I am Joy Clark. So thank you so much for your time.